I have come forward to support the resolution and I would add that I have come forward to urge with all the strength in my power that this resolution be pushed to its conclusion at this sitting. Sir, my respect for Dr. Jayakar and Pandit Kundru is very great. I have considered with very great care all that they have said in support of this motion, the amendment, proposing an adjournment of this discussion until the representatives of the Muslim League and the representatives of the Indian states have joined us. There is only one complaint I have to make against this motion for adjournment. I consider, sir, that it lacks imagination. I say so without disrespect to my friend. I say it lacks imagination because it forgets that we have just launched ourselves on a very big task and it is necessary that we should impress our country and the world that we mean business. Now, sir, look at this resolution. It is a resolution which sets out the objectives that we have to place before ourselves in framing our constitution. Is such a resolution to be postponed till we reach the last stage of our work in this assembly. Is it not a resolution which must preface everything substantial that we propose to do in this assembly? That, I think, sir, is a complete answer to this motion for adjournment. The mover and the supporter of the amendment have urged reasons for postponing the consideration of this resolution. But in doing so, they have admitted that there is nothing in this resolution to which either of them is prepared to take exception. I appeal to them, sir, that if they believe in this resolution, they must pass it at this sitting before we commence real business and not postpone it till we have practically completed all our business. I know, sir, that Dr. Jayakar, towards the close of his speech, suggested that the consideration of this resolution may be postponed only for about a month, by the end of which he hoped that the representatives of the Muslim League would have joined us. But what about the representatives of the Indian states? For no fault of this constituent assembly, the representatives of the Indian states have not come into this assembly at the start, as I consider it is their right to do. But the procedure has been so regulated that they can come in only at the final sitting of this constituent assembly. Are we to wait for them? After all, the most vocal objection has come to this resolution outside this house, has come from people representing represent the Indian states. Now, taking the representatives of the Muslim League themselves, are we doing any injustice to them in proceeding with this resolution? Their main objection to what we are doing today is the different interpretation they have put upon the clause relating to grouping. We are not discussing grouping. We are discussing this resolution which lays down the objectives of our work, a matter in respect to which they have a perfect right to come and participate in this debate. What prevents them doing it, taking their seats here and doing it? What uh, prevents them from their coming here and debating with us the other questions that we are taking up as a preliminary to the more important work that will follow. Their main objection will arise only when this assembly towards the end of the first session proposes to split into section. And as I shall show in a minute, sir, it is quite possible for them to raise all the issue that they want to raise when we reach that stage. Now, sir, the question as regards grouping has he entered on a new face with the statement made by His Majesty's government on the 6th of this month. 
but I would not go into the merits of what they have said in that statement. The only thing I would say that it is a most astonishing statement to be made by so august a body as His Majesty's government at this stage of the controversy. Beyond that, I do not propose to go into the merits of that statement. Now let us see what flows from that statement. His Majesty's government have said that their interpretation and the interpretation of the Muslim League agree. But they say since you agreed to refer the matter to the federal court or since you said that the constituent assembly will do so, you may do so. And we have the statement of Lord Patrick Lawrence only yesterday clinching the matter by saying his Majesty's government wouldn't budge from their position even if you appeal to the federal court. Now, sir, what is the position? If we go to the federal court and the federal court gives a decision in favor of the view taken by the Congress, the Muslim League has categorically stated it would not accept it. His Majesty's government say they would not budge from their own view of the matter. Of course, it is not within the jurisdiction of His Majesty's government, in my opinion, to say whether they would accept the federal court's view or whether they would not, because it is entirely out of their hands. The Constituent Assembly makes the reference to the federal court, and it is for the Constituent Assembly to say before it makes the reference that it will abide by the decision of the federal court. What will happen? Assuming that the federal court's decision is in favor of the view taken by His Majesty's government, what is will be the position of those who have taken a contrary view? The only thing they can do in view of all the commitments they have made to individual provinces and communities. Community.